praise the Lord this morning. That's good to be here. Good to see everyone out today. Darling, good to see you. Have, glad to have you back today. Truly it is. Thank you. It's good to have you back. She's still on the road to recovery, so continue, continue to pray for her. She still has a ways to go, but we're glad she's here. And, uh, just continue to lift everyone up in prayers that uh, have been brought forward this morning. Okay. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. We'll take it to the end of the chapter, verse 26. Galatians 5, beginning verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Again, against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, or envying each other. Amen. May God bless his word today. Let's pray. Our Father God, we come before your presence this morning thanking you for this morning's hour. We thank you, Lord God, for this church that we have, that we're able to just gather here today to, to assemble, to, uh, to come to worship you, and to come to praise you, and to come to hear you speak to us today, Father. We thank you, Lord God, that we have that freedom, the freedom that was given to us by the sacrifices of so many people and the willingness of so many people to serve our country and defend our freedom and our right to be able to assemble together, Father. So let us never, ever take that for granted. But always remember that, Lord, that free, our freedom is not free. And as we look at your word this morning, Father God, we pray your blessings to be upon it, that it does not return to you void, but just speak to us what you once spoken this morning, Lord God, and we ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, uh, husband and wife take their little nine-month-old child to the mall. And like most men who go to the mall, 99% of most men that go to the mall with their wives are looking for the bench. They can stretch out on and relax with a little bit while their wives do the shopping. That 1% who goes with the wives really don't want to go with the wives, ladies. They really don't want to be with you, but they won't admit it. And if they say they want to be with you, they're really lying. So don't do that, guys. But anyway, anyway. So they, they go to the mall, they take their little nine-month-old boy with them, and, and sure enough, the wife, she wants to wander off and go do the shopping, and the husband says, okay, I'm just going to take the time, me and the little one, we're going to sit here on the bench while mama shops. And they're doing fine, about five minutes into the uh, sitting and watching people go by, all of a sudden a baby just starts screaming and crying and wailing and, and uncontrollable. And the, and the father down in front of the little baby, it's going to be okay, Albert. It's going to be all right. Calm down, Albert. Calm down. Relax, Albert. Relax, Albert. It's okay, Albert. She'll be back in a few minutes, Albert. It's going to be okay. And there was this lady standing there with her little child. She got up to watch and see what was going on. She said, sir, she said, I just want to commend you on such a great job that you're doing with little Albert. He said, little Albert? He said, I'm Albert. <laughs> the point being, the point being, self-control, self-control. 
My question to you this morning is, do you have it? It's a simple term, it's a simple phrase, it's something that, that, that is there, but it's a very, very difficult thing for people to possess all the time. And self-control can range from something as simple as passing up that Oreo cookie or that extra piece of pie uh, uh, or, or spending time, too much time on the computer or too much time in front of the television. It could all the way go all the way to sexual immorality and watching things and doing things that you ought not to be doing in a wide span and spans of things, okay? with self-control. People uh, lose their self-control when they're maybe out driving. You know, it's tough enough to drive in Garrett County in the summertime or around the Wisp area in the wintertime when people come here with not even all-season tires on. They just got their summer tread on, you know, and, and we go down, you know, down along the lake in the summertime and, and it's kind of crazy down there. Or you maybe take off for the city, right? Or you know, on vacation, you're going through Baltimore, wherever you may be going to. But it's not Garrett County. It's not home, you know. Or it's 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 not uh, it's not Somerset County, you know. It's not it's not the back roads that we have. And all of a sudden, people change. You know, you people are nice and mellow and passive here in church and pulling out nice and gently out onto the road here. All of a sudden, you have this thing called road rage. Anybody ever have road rage? Yeah, you don't want to admit that in church, do you? No, it would have been a lot of things, but not road rage, Ron. Uh -uh, not you, buddy. I don't know. I don't know. She just looked at you, you know. Yeah, you know, and, and yet we are called, when we look at our scripture reading today, when we look at all these, all this, what we call the, 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 the fruit of the Spirit, self-control is one of these fruits part of the fruit of the Spirit that Paul talks about. Self-control. And, and it's something given to us, obviously, by God. But as many the, as all these other characteristics of the fruit are mentioned, they all must be worked at. Even though He gives them to us, if we don't try to maintain self-control in our life and in the things that we do, it's very easy for us to be in the way of the world and do the things in the way of the world. You know, we are called to be a separate people and we are called to let our light shine before others so that they can see us and give God the glory. But when we don't main, maintain self-control in our lives, when people see us throw fits of rage, as an example, and, and do things that we ought not to be doing, people look at us from the outside world and they are quick to judge you. And by judging you, they are judging the Christian church. To maintain self-control. To develop self-control. How good are you doing at that? The Apostle Paul, he, he, he was uh, before Felix. Okay, you know the story about you know, where he was before Felix uh, in the book of Acts. And he was talking to Felix about righteousness, self-control, and judgment. And he was expounding on those topics. And whatever Paul was saying to Felix, Felix didn't want to hear it. He didn't want to hear what Paul had to say about those topics. And he stopped Paul in his tracks and dismissed Paul and says, I'll call you at a more convenient time for me. Maybe when you're not really wanting to expound and tell me about this thing called righteousness and self-control and judgment. I don't want to hear it, is what Felix was saying. Maybe you don't want to hear anything to do with self-control. Being a person of self-control doesn't mean that you are weak. It doesn't mean that you let people roll over you, because certainly the Apostle Paul never let anyone <coughs> roll over him as we read the Scriptures. Jesus never let anyone roll over him in the Scriptures. And we go through all the, 
all the uh, people of the Old Testament, the heroes of faith in the Old Testament, none of those people let people roll over them. <clears throat> the disciples and the apostles and the writers and, and all the prophets, they were more than willing to speak out and defend themselves and defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. But yet, in that whole process, they maintained self-control. When I started taking a look at this thing called self-control, and, and, you know, most of you know the story, the, the experience that we had this past week. And I've had conversations with people who would say something to me like, well, you should just let them have it. Now, you know, I ran it on the, and, and, and by the way, I took that down off of Facebook. I want everyone to know that. I took that down off of Facebook, what I wrote. Okay, but people thought I should have ran and rain, you know, and, and threw a fit. Okay, when I was dealing with the uh, with the hotel. Okay, I didn't do that, and people say, "Well, I'm just I just sit back and let things happen to me." Well, I, want, I do want to say this. Okay, he did call me, just so you know, he did call me, and. He has sent in the mail a gift certificate to us. All right. He apologized for everything that happened. Okay. But I wonder where my testimony would have been if I would have gotten in their face and threw a fit. See, a lot of people will get well, you know, good personal satisfaction out of doing that because I got the you know final word in or I got my say so in. But would I have been a good witness for Jesus? Would he have been happy if I would have done that? You see, we are called to maintain self-control in our lives. To maintain self-control. And again, that self-control deals with all aspects of our life. Not just the self-control in that kind of a situation. Or not just the self-control that we may have when we're on a diet and pushing the food away or backing away from the table. But we're to maintain self-control in all aspects of our life. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking about intimacy between a husband and a wife. And the fact that we need to maintain our self-control. There's going to be times, he said, that you should not have those intimate relationships with your spouse, but rather devote this time to fasting and prayer. And then come back together, but to maintain self-control. The Apostle Paul told Timothy and he told Titus that when you're looking for an overseer, when you're looking for someone to lead a church, that they need to have some qualities or some attributes, some characteristics of leadership in order to be over a church. He said that they need to be above reproach, faithful to their wives, temperate, Respectable, hospitable, able to teach, and have self-control. He gave a little different list of Titus. He said you need to be hospitable, which is a uh, saying. Got to love what's good, be upright, holy, and disciplined, and have self-control. Why? Because the world is watching. They are watching you. You are under the microscope, and people are watching. They are watching to see how you respond or react to situations. Often, I don't know if anybody here, uh, some of you will be familiar with a man named Zig Ziglar. Yeah, Zig Ziglar said you're either going to respond or react. He said if you respond to medicine, you're doing well. But if you have a reaction to medicine, that's maybe not so good, you know. And the world is watching to see whether you respond or react to situations. People will sometimes deliberately put you in a situation, step on your toes or cause problems just to see how you're going to respond or react. And they can pass that judgment on you. But oh, you know, 
It's tough. It's tough. It is. It is. But, uh, you know, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. And with Jesus, all things are possible. In, in, in Gospels, you know, Jesus said uh, that you can't do anything without me. We need Jesus in our lives. For us to really be, be able to maintain that true self-control in our lives, we need Jesus. He has to be at the forefront of our lives for us to be able to maintain self-control in situations. It just doesn't happen, though. We accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, but if we just let it go at that and don't, don't work at maintaining self-control, then you will not have self-control. Is anything impossible for God? Do you know of individuals who would always throw fits of rage, but once they came to know Jesus, they were truly a new creature? Because with God, all things are possible. If you are a person who cannot control themselves in their, your behaviors or in your actions or in your words, then may I encourage you to dig deeper into God's Word. May I encourage you to take time with the Father, with God Himself, and pray to Him and ask Him to to give you self-control in your life. So that when we are in those circumstances, when somebody cuts out in front of us, you know, uh, on the four lane or, or passes us on the right when they ought not to be passing on the right, you know, that we don't get bent out of shape. Or when things aren't accessible to us as they ought to be or we think that they ought to be. When the food at the restaurant isn't the way you want it, God will give you the self control, but you have to be seeking and looking and asking for that. You know, it's a whole better life than you can have to maintain self control. How are you doing with it? How are you doing? The, the second chapter of Titus is a rather interesting chapter. Again, the Apostle Paul is writing uh, to Titus. Uh, he's in Crete. And Paul left him there. And he was there to help maintain the established church that Paul started. But he had quite a job ahead of him. And so he wrote... He wrote to Titus, and really, when you have an opportunity, just open up the second chapter of Titus and really dig deep into it. But he tells them, he says, to teach. You know, so he tells them, Titus, he says, to teach the older men to be temperate and worthy of respect and of sound faith and love and endurance and maintain self-control. Teach the people to be have self-control. So obviously, if it's teachable, it's learnable. So you can learn self-control. And to the woman, to the women, he said, he tells, them, he tells them to te you know, tell them to be self-controlled and pure and to be busy at home, to be kind and, and to be subject to their husbands um, so that they don't align one another in the Word of God. <clears throat> For the women to, be, to maintain self-control and to the younger men, likewise, to maintain self-control. Uh, then it goes on down to the second chapter of Titus. It talks about God's grace and salvation that we have in Jesus. And through that salvation and the grace that we have, it says it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And it teaches us to live lives of self-control. Upright, godly lives in this present age the age and the time that we're living in right now. <clears throat> because yes, the world is watching. Don't think that they aren't. Your little children are watching. Your grandchildren are watching. The 
mom and dad maintained self-control? Does grandma and grandpa maintain self-control? They may not be using that word, but they see it. The group of people that fascinate me are the preschool or the the, uh, the, uh, the daycare people, you know? The teachers and the, the people who take care of this little, little, the littlest of little, to be able to maintain self-control. That's a tough job to take a guy. You know? We think, sometimes in education, we think, uh, oh, the, probably one of the most biggest challenges is the middle school, right? I don't know. I don't know, it's a different animal, but, uh, but uh, you know, those, those little one, two, and three-year-olds, put 20 of those in a room together and see what you got. But to maintain self-control in your lives. Our call to worship this morning, my buddy read it. It says, like a city whose walls are broken through. Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. And then earlier in Proverbs it says, better a patient person than a warrior, one with self-control than one who takes a city. But you can develop, even though it's the gift, one of the gifts that, uh, or excuse me, not the gift, one of the fruit, part of the fruit, I'll get it right here, part of the fruit that Paul was talking about. In verse 17 it says, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. Because in the flesh, the acts of the flesh are very obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. It says those who live this way will not inherit the kingdom of God, but all the fruit of the Spirit. Part of that is self-control. See, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. So really, how are you doing in your area of self-control? If it's not where it ought to be, again, may I just encourage you, Get into God's Word. God wants to bless you. God wants you to have self-control in your life. He wants you to be salt and light to your neighbors, to the people you work with, to your family. He doesn't want to see the fits of rage and all the other things that go on but to control yourself. That's what he wants you to do. And you can do that. Ask God for the help. Amen. Amen. So within our faith, we are saved. We have faith. We are to add to our faith goodness. And to goodness, we are to add knowledge and to knowledge we are to add self-control second peter chapter 1 verse 6 we are to build on our faith we don't want to be 20 year christians and simply say i am saved without growing in christ we are called to grow as people and not live in the infancy, if you would, of a new Christian. If you've been holding the Christian flag up for quite a while and you've not grown, it's because you have not wanted to grow. You've been, you've been just sitting back and just settling for that lifestyle, which is good. Which is good. Take it and grow it more, more into an intimate relationship with God, with Jesus. Add to that faith goodness. 
and to the goodness, knowledge, and to the knowledge, self-control. See how your relationship with Him blossoms and grows. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. It'll take you to that, you know, sometimes in our Christian walk, you know, it doesn't seem like sometimes in our Christian walk we do this, but it doesn't seem like we plateau sometimes, and then we do it again, and then we plateau. Well, take, take, take this and build on your faith and watch, you, 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 all of a sudden you're going to see yourself increasing in your relationship with Him. And you'll plateau sometime, but then you'll catch, up, catch it again and increase. But build on your faith. 